this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and today we're continuing our discussions about the Passover celebration. It's more relevant to you than you might think. Well, here this year, the Passover celebration falls in April. It follows the lunar calendar, so sometimes it does fall in March. And in the weeks leading up to it, we're going to take a deep dive into all things Passover. And the teaching is going to be based on the book the Passover Backstory by my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss. Well, this episode is part two of the series. In the last episode, we laid the groundwork for understanding the Passover celebration. My dad talked about what is called the Passover Seder, which is really the order of the service. It's the main ceremony that takes place in the week of Passover. He also told us about three non-negotiables for a Seder. Those are one, retelling the Exodus story, you know, Moses and the let my people go. The second thing is eating matzah. This is what my dad called a Texas cracker. And then three, no comets. That means leaven. You can't have anything with yeast in it. The leaven represents sin. I hope you got all of that. Sorry, I know it was a quick recap. And at the end of the last episode, my dad said this. Passover is a bridge connecting Jews and Christians. It's relevant to both. Well, stick with us during this series and you'll see that for yourself and gain a whole new appreciation for the Passover festival. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls. We're gonna be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait, a separate checks, please. I love Passover. It's my favorite non-Turkey holiday. Those of us who are interested in Passover and things Jewish like to become better informed about the things that interest us. And you may still wonder why we make such a big deal about a 3,500 year old holiday. I'm glad you asked. A few years ago, I was doing a Passover presentation for a great local church in Texas. It was pastored by Gary Osborne a former Bible college professor. I love Gary. He's a great man of God. His introduction to my Seder was the absolute best I could ever imagine. He said, this won't be a regular Passover celebration, but more like we're all sitting around a campfire in the Middle East while a Jewish brother tells us about the greatest cosmic rescue mission in the history of the earth. So what was the greatest cosmic rescue mission in the history of the earth? The importance of our Exodus and Passover cannot be overstated. Therein, redemption history took shape. Thereby, the physical nation of Israel came into existence and therefore God's covenant with the Jewish people was finally made known and they became the people of that covenant. God's promises then became rooted in a land that was to become the land of his people. A Passover center point in redemption history, the greatest cosmic rescue mission in the history of the earth is revealed in the Passover account and God's salvation plan of the ages. And as we say in Texas, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. A Seder should transcend a religious ceremony. Passover ushers us into a redemptive event. The path of our redemption runs through the heart of Egypt and settles into the center of a Seder. God took us out of Egypt and he's still taking Egypt out of us. Yet even the failings of my people in the desert were not wasted. 
Paul explained the greatest value of Israel's trials in the wilderness that must never be lost on us. He said, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We know what the term Seder means, and we know the meaning of Haggadah. Perhaps it would be wise to present a concept that seems simple, but is kind of complex. Well, what is Pesach? This is the Hebrew term that simply means Passover. But what does Passover really mean? Well, even that depends on who you ask. You see, Pesach is not always called Passover. Pesach is also known by several other names. <laughs> What's in a name? In addition to the Hebrew name Pesach, the holiday is also identified by other Hebrew names, such as Chag Ha'aviv, the holiday of spring, and Zaman Cherutenu, the season of our liberation. How about Chag Hamatzot, the holiday of unleavened bread? Additionally, did you know that Passover is really like a new year? We were standing right on the verge of our exodus from Egypt when God declared our new year. The Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Well, about now you should be asking, how can that be? So I want to give you a quick college course in Jewish dating, or calendars 101. Odd as this may sound, the actual Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, is celebrated in the seventh month of the year. The first holiday on the Jewish calendar is always Passover. Maybe this warrants a brief lesson about the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar isn't like our secular calendar. Throughout the Western world, a solar calendar is used based upon the sun. Muslims reckon month and year according to the moon, so they have a lunar calendar. The Jewish calendar, contrary to popular views, is a mix of both. Jews have 12 months of 29 and a half days each calculated by the moon, yet the year is reckoned by the sun. And this leaves us with an extra 11 days to take up annually. How do we adjust for this? With leap years. During every second or third year, seven in 19 years to be precise, we have a 13th month, which is known as the second Adar. Does this sound confusing? Trust me, it gets worse. How many new years are recognized by most observant Jews? Well, there was a debate in the Talmud. Was the world created in Nisan, spring, or in Tishrei, fall? The Talmud settled it. You're both right. I'm here to tell you that there are four Jewish new years. So don't say I didn't warn you. But it also gets really exciting, so don't fret. We have four New Years. Number one, the month of Passover in Nisan begins the New Year for determining the reign of kings, as well as the actual biblical first month. God decreed that Nisan is the first month of the biblical religious calendar. As we celebrate our freedom from Egypt, we acknowledge the true beginning of the Jewish year and that epoch of Judaism that brought clarity to the Jewish people's religious connection to God. As previously explained, the nation of Israel was born at Passover. Kind of think of it like a Jewish Independence Day, the 4th of July, and Happy New Year all rolled into one super spiritual celebration. And two, Elul is the new year for tithing animals. The Talmud presumed that most animals were born during the month of Av, and the rabbis decided that, that the required tithe of sheep and cattle detailed in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 32, would therefore be ready for sacrifice by Elul. 
The third new year is Shavat, and that's the new year for trees with the celebration of Tu Bishvat. Tu Bishvat was sort of like the world's first Jewish Earth Day. And our fourth new year, it's probably the most famous, is Tishrei. Rosh Hashanah is celebrated in Tishrei, marking the anniversary of the creation of the world. Rosh means head. Hashanah means the year. So Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year, or traditionally it's considered the Jewish New Year. I know this can get a little bit deep at times, uh, so I appreciate you sticking with us. We're gonna take a short break, let you take a breather, and then we'll jump right back in. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. Thanks for sticking with us. We got a lot more to go, so let's jump right back in. You know, I, I've learned that it's unwise to assume every person who listens or reads what I write understands the intent of the words selected that are in a book, an article, or a podcast, or a blog. Even clearly written communication can be misunderstood. Therefore, this strange format dealing with obscure material in foreign words is even more easily confused or lost in translation. Some may also be unfamiliar with the nomenclature, the terms of the trade. These things can be confusing to folks not accustomed to hearing them. Even simple terms can have complex meanings. Previously, I provided the translation of the word Pesach as Passover. It should be simple enough, but even that is possibly misunderstood without more explanation. So let me ask, what is the Passover? Actually, the Passover can accurately describe four different aspects of the biblical festival of Pesach. It could be any of the following. The name of the holiday is Passover. It is a term to describe the Paschal lamb that was sacrificed. A special peace offering of the festival was known by the same name, the Passover. The Passover is also the name of the festival meal. We sit down and have a Passover. Therefore, it is helpful to understand the context of the word when Passover is used in a description. I would not want to accidentally pass over any meaningful details that might help readers enjoy and understand a Passover Seder. As promised earlier, I want to mention another Haggadah before I bring you my own version of the liturgy. Stay with me, we're almost there. What liturgical benefit comes from a can of coffee? Well, I grew up using a very famous Passover Haggadah. More than 50 million copies of the Maxwell House Haggadah have been printed since 1932. It is literally, I'm not making this up, the Maxwell House Passover Haggadah is literally the oldest, longest running sales promotion in the history of of advertising, booyah. Connecting Passover to coffee was a stroke of genius going back to 1923. At that time, the ad firm 
got a rabbi to certify that coffee was kosher for Passover. It's Pesadik. <laughs> Although beans and, uh, you know, they're a legume, they're not permitted during Passover. But the rabbi declared them to be more like a berry than a bean. So the full page ad likened a cup of Maxwell House coffee to the fifth cup at the Seder. It was brilliant. And so it began. By 1932, customers at supermarkets were receiving a free Maxwell House Haggadah with a can of Maxwell House coffee. Even former President Obama used the Maxwell House Haggadah at his presidential Passover Seders. So tell me again now, what was the Last Supper? By now, you might be wondering, what is it I've gotten myself into? You might even be questioning if you still want to celebrate a Passover. I hope you do. You see, when you join me and my people in enjoying a Seder, you connect yourself to an ancient tradition. Think about it. Passover is the oldest continuously practiced celebration in human history. The Passover has been celebrated for more than 3,500 years. And as you now know, the Last Supper was really the last Passover Seder of our Jewish Messiah. It was attended by his Jewish friends known as Talmidim. You might call them students or disciples. Some might wonder why non-Jews would care about such a Jewish festival. Well, since it is one of the very few events recorded in all four Gospels, the better question would be, if it was good enough for Jesus, why not me? So don't quit now. On Thursday night of the Passion Week, the 14th day of Nisan, Jesus did what all Jews did, and we still do most of these same things today. Jesus celebrated a Passover Seder. Everything from the wine to the matzah was part of his Jewish liturgy. Jesus was an observant Jew fulfilling his Jewish duty. He was obeying the words of Scripture, which deemed several festivals, including the Passover celebration, to be conducted as a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. If you join in a Passover celebration, you will definitely be doing what Jesus did. You will be hearing prayers that he prayed. You will be listening to stories he grew up hearing, and you will be obeying the same commandments he obeyed. I believe the result of following in his steps will lead you closer to him, and you will also be better prepared to understand his love. I guess I would just ask you, why miss the blessing? You know, Jesus never stopped being a Jew. He never told his friends to discontinue Judaic practices. Modern Christians are not legally bound to obey the Jewish regulations to obtain or to maintain salvation. Yet I must ask again, why miss the blessing? Great joy can be obtained from understanding and celebrating the Jewish festivals. Jesus and the earliest Christians practiced what was taught in the Holy Scriptures. This was their ancient biblical heritage. Is it any less our Christian heritage? Of course not. Do you know the one new man secret? And there's more. I've been withholding a secret. Now I must open a mystery that was hidden. And this is the secret that the Gentiles will have their full share with the Jews and all the riches inherited by God's sons, both are invited to belong to his church and all of God's promises of mighty blessings through Christ apply to them both when they accept the good news about Christ and what he has done for them. God has given me the wonderful privilege of telling everyone about this plan of his and he has given me his power and special ability to do it well. Just think, 
though I did nothing to deserve it, and though I am the most useless Christian there is, yet I was the one chosen for this special joy of telling the Gentiles the glad news of the endless treasures available to them in Christ. And to explain to everyone that God is the Savior of the Gentiles too, just as he who made all things had secretly planned from the very beginning. This is relevant because there was a time when God had an exclusive relationship with the Jews. I, I relate to the words of Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, that I just spoke to you. I sometimes feel like I have that privilege also as a Jew to share the love of God and the coming of Messiah with my non-Jewish friends and acquaintances. And I think it's important to understand that there was a time when God had an exclusive relationship with the Jews. You see, non-Jews were not yet invited into the bond at that time, that bond of promise that God had with Israel. Speaking to the Gentiles, the apostle said that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But then the door of salvation was opened to the Gentiles and things changed. God did a creative new miracle when he made the Jews and Gentiles into what he deemed to be the one new man. This was a sovereign decision of God to create in himself one new man from the two. In Christ, God miraculously blended us together to worship him as one. Therefore, we should honor him as God desired. Passover is a great starting point. Let's do what Jesus did at Passover. So you might wonder, can a non-Jew participate in a Passover Seder? Well, you know, before we get too far and before the doors are locked, here's a question some non-Jews might be wondering. Is it even safe to be here in a Passover Seder, should you be sitting in one? Well, let's see what God declared about that matter. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the instructions for the festival of Passover. No outsiders, non-Jews, goyim, no outsiders are allowed to eat the Passover meal. Hmm, doesn't that seem restrictive? Well, God continued, but any slave who has been purchased may eat it Wait for it. He may eat it if he has been circumcised. I guess if you're not a slave, this doesn't apply. Temporary residents and hired servants may not eat it. That's what it says. Awkward, but not a deal breaker so far. <laughs> the whole community of Israel must celebrate this Passover festival. If there are foreigners living among you who want to celebrate the Lord's Passover, wait for it, let all their males be circumcised. Only then may they celebrate the Passover with you like any native-born Israelite. But no uncircumcised male may ever eat the Passover meal. This instruction applies to everyone, whether a native-born Israelite or a foreign living among you. Now, if you're hearing these words and you happen to be sitting at a Passover Seder, I'm guessing any uncircumcised gentlemen are quietly heading toward the exits, but there's no need to run. If anyone is concerned about this biblical mandate, we could call a local royal and request a while you wait service. Um, FYI, the moil, uh, these folks are all well-trained in the practice of Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision. And I guess I should probably mention that in some Jewish communities, the moil is also the local kosher butcher 
and Cantor. In addition to performing circumcisions, you can just check in your yellow pages if you need the service. But really, there's no need to run, no need to worry. Anyone who desires to honor God and remember the great miracles recounted at our Passover are welcome to praise the Lord with us. No questions asked. Contrary to what the Exodus text implies, circumcision is not a requirement. And the Talmud concurs by saying an uncircumcised non-Jew may keep the Seder and the festival of Passover, but he or she cannot eat from the actual Pesach sacrifice. He, quote, shall not eat of it, unquote. But he may eat unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. <laughs> Since we have no animal sacrifice from which to eat at our Seder, no emergency surgery is required. Besides, everything is symbolic, so you can enjoy the celebration and shed no blood. If you are a believer in our Messiah, the blood has already been shed on your behalf. A wonderful Jewish author captured the comparison perfectly. I was so impressed to read this by a Jewish man. He said, what Jesus is to Christians, the original Paschal Lamb, is to Jews. He captured the parallel between Jews and Christians succinctly, saying, in both cases, we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. And I must say, Amen. This Jewish scholar thoroughly grasped the similarity and the distinction. Well, I hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> there's a lot more where that comes from, and I know that there's probably some uh, peaked interest, if you will, where you might want to read a little bit more and dig a little bit deeper into the Passover and the Passover backstory. I encourage you, if this has piqued your interest or you've got some questions, you can find out more at our website, crosstalk.org, or of course you can get more information about the book at randyweiss.com. You're also welcome to download a free PDF copy of the book. It's available at the website. And uh, I encourage you, if you've found some of these uh, different points interesting or humorous, or you want to engage about it, talk about it, you can always reach out and engage with us on social media. You can find us by searching the handle at Crosstalk TV, and that's available on most of the different social platforms. And of course, if you've got prayer requests that we could be lifting up, don't hesitate to reach out. You can do that through social media, through the website. You can email us at info at crosstalk.org. Or of course, you can call us at 1-800-688-3422. If you'd like a copy of the book, you can also get that by calling us at that number, 1-800-688-3422, or at the website. So feel free, reach out to us. Let us know how we can serve you. And until next time, shalom and God bless.